my entire outlook on life has changed. And you, you, two years ago, most of you know that I had a brain bleed. It was a scare. It almost uh, killed me. Doctor said I should have been dead or a vegetable uh, verbatim, what the doctor told us. And I have a different outlook in life. God spared my life. I have a different outlook. And my outlook today is an outlook of urgency. My outlook is an outlook of gratitude. My outlook is an outlook of reverence. And, and because everything in life is a gift. Would you say that out loud with me? Everything in life is a gift. I actually wanted those words to come up on the screen, whoever's screen wording. Can you, can you put those words on the, everything in life is a gift. Tell somebody next to you, my life is a gift. And, and, and now tell them, your life is a gift. Your life is a gift. I really want you to think about this because your life is a gift given to you by God. Right, your, 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 your health, it's a gift. Your time, it's a gift. Another breath in your lungs, it's a gift. Another heartbeat, it's, it's, it's a gift. Your personalities are a gift. Your mind, your memory, your abilities, your skills, your talents, all gifts. Even things that you've worked for in your life, you would not have if God didn't give you the abilities that he's given you. So you say, well, I, I made this money, like I earned, but you, you are given God given abilities. And everything's a gift. Your relationships are a gift. Your mother is a gift. Your father is a gift. Your children are a gift. Your friendships, families, gifts, your background, your experiences, your freedom is a gift. Your business or businesses, your finances, your network, your ministry, your calling, it is a gift. Your successes, your wins, your mountaintops, they are a gift, but maybe you've never considered this because also your trials, your hardships, your challenges are also a gift. Your pain, your problems, your anguish, your agony, they are gifts. That betrayal, it was a gift. The rejection you went through, it was a gift. That heartbreak, a gift. Those failures, all gifts. The highs, the lows, the plateaus in life are all gifts from God. And my question for you this morning is, what are you doing with the gift? What are you doing with the gift? More specifically, what are you doing with the gift that God has given you? The answer should be that you use it, that you put it to work for God, right? Think of gifts as talents, because that's what the Bible refers to. Our gifts and abilities, they're like talents. Everybody has a certain pool of talents that God has given you. When I, when I used to coach my daughter in basketball, there were times that, man, I'd really, I'd really, I'd really have to get on her. I don't recommend parents coaching their kids, by the way. I, I, there were times, I, my, my daughter, she was an incredible point guard, went on to play college basketball, a point guard, but she's what many people would refer to as a past first point guard, a pass first point guard, meaning I, I, my default is I want to pass before I would want to shoot, right? And that can, be, that can be looked at as a great teammate, somebody that's unselfish. But there were times when she wasn't a pass first point guard. She was a pass only point guard. And she was one of the best shooters in the state of Arizona. And there were times, man, dad, coach dad, I'd be yelling at the top, Kylie, shoot the ball. Like, like, you know, there's a fine line between like encouragement and I'm like pissed. Like, where is that? I'm not sure. I figured that out yet. And she would start shooting the ball and then it would help 
her team out. So is it more selfish to give the ball away to people that can't score? Or is it more selfish to keep the ball and, and score, right? And, and, and I think my point today is, is that so many of us in here have been given some special gifts, but you're not using them. You're not using them. Oh, you're so gifted. You're so gifted, so talented. The abilities that God has given you, but you're a pass first player in life, maybe a pass only player in life. Like you're passive with the gifts God has given you. You pass up opportunities by putting your gifts to work, right? You're not, you're not helping your team. Listen to me. You're not helping your team by not using your gifts. You've got to use your gift. You're actually hurting your team. Uh, look at somebody and tell them this. The church needs you. Tell them. Look at them. Look at somebody and tell them. the Because some somebody just needs somebody else to tell them that. One more time, somebody else. Look at somebody else and say, this church needs you. Tell them, this church needs you. You ever heard the, you ever heard the, the person out in the world that goes, I love Jesus, I just don't go to church. Impossible. No, you don't. Because the church, the Bible calls the bride of Christ. You, you must love the bride of Christ. You must love the bride of Christ. I, I got saved because of Jesus Christ, but I fell in love with the bride of Christ. It's the body of believers that at the beginning I needed so desperately and over time realized they need me too. And some of you, you attend church often or maybe today's your first time in a long time or maybe you go once a month or maybe you go twice a month. Maybe you go four times a month, but you're not being used. And God wants you to use your gifts to serve the church, to serve the body of Christ. God needs you, but so many times we keep passing the ball. Somebody else will shoot. Somebody else will shoot. Somebody else will shoot. Somebody else will do it. Somebody else will sign up. Somebody else will help North Phoenix. Somebody else will help South Scottsdale. Somebody else will help PT and Natalie. Somebody else will help Pastor Natalie in the, 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 the ministries that she, somebody else will help. And that somebody else is you. That somebody else is you. That somebody else is you. And you've all heard this saying, if you don't use it, you will lose it. Because if you don't use the gifts God's given you, you will lose those gifts that he's given you. And maybe you've heard this before as well, but all of our lives could be summed up into really three major categories of gifts. They are your time, your talents, and your treasures, right? Let's say those three words out loud. Your time, your talents, and your treasures. Those are given to you by God, but he did not give those to you for selfish gain. You guys awake with me this morning? Everybody awake? I'm just getting, this is my intro. This is all introduction stuff. I'm just getting to it. He, he gives us time. So out of seven days a week, how much time did you give God this week? How much time out of seven days a week did you give to others that the time was because of and about God? Not, oh yeah, I gave my time. I was down in South Scottsdale last night clubbing away, giving my time away. Our time, our talents, and treasures can be summed up as our lives. And he didn't give them to us for selfish gain. He didn't give you those three time, talent, and treasures just for yourself. He gave them to you to use for God, for building God's kingdom, 
and to use for other people and to help build his church. You are gifted. You're gifted. And every God-given gift comes with a responsibility. If you're taking notes, that's a good one to write down. Every God-given gift comes with a responsibility. I'm about to finally start getting to my message and start preaching. Every God-given gift comes with a responsibility. Responsibility. We all have responsibilities in life, but the greatest, listen, the greatest responsibility in life are the spiritual responsibilities, not paying bills. The greatest responsibility in life are the spiritual responsibilities. And so what are spiritual responsibilities? Well, write this down. Number one is turn your phone off before you go to church. That's the first one. I think I've got four Sundays in a row where phones rang. That's amazing. And, and, and before that, I don't think it's happened for like a year. So something's, something's in the air. The, 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 the phone ringing air. Here's what I want you to write down. What are spiritual responsibilities? Spiritual responsibility is this. It's your response to his ability. So what is it? What is your response to his ability? Your response. Yours, not mine. What is your response to God's ability? What is your response to the gifts that God has given you, time, talent, and treasures. And I want you to think about these gifts and talents that God gave you in, in two words. And this is gonna be the next two weeks of sermons. So today is influence, and next Sunday is affluence. And we're gonna look at both because your life is made up of influence and affluence. And today I wanna to look specifically at the power of influence. Listen, back in May, we started this growth campaign, this spiritual growth, but this financial growth campaign to do something radical. Many of you were here back in May, and we stepped out in this series and we talked about radical faith. We talked about radical sacrifice. We talked about radical giving and radical generosity. We talked about radical service. We talked about radical love. You know, when I think about radical service, you know one of the things that I think of, the first thing probably actually that comes to my mind when I think of radical service at Impact Churches, I think of the guys that show up at 5 a.m. and volunteer their time to put 380 no parking signs out. That, that's pretty impressive. Radical service. Radical service. So many of us in here, so many of you are involved in radical service. Some of you have learned Radical generosity. Some of you have learned how to be radical in your giving. Some of you have learned how to be radical in your selflessness and your sacrifice and, and, and even in your faith. And, and, and we all have room to grow. So we had this fundraising campaign. And really, I don't like when in church we call it a fundraiser because it's really not a fundraiser. It's a faith raiser. Right, And we said, hey, we're going to buy this old church building in South Scottsdale, and then we're going to try to buy it in cash, and we're going we're gonna to try to take it down debt-free. And if you missed last Sunday, well, you should hear it today. Congratulations, Impact Church family, because two Thursdays ago, we closed on that building, and we paid for it in cash, <laughs> debt-free. And that's you guys, it's, it's us collectively that came together and we said, we're gonna do this. And so our first goal is completed. And by the way, we did that in like four or five months. That's impressive. Like I am impressed, I am so proud of our church family. And so the first, the first box is checked. The first goal is completed. That's exciting because I didn't know if we were gonna to need to take out a loan or a small loan. We didn't have to. We, we bought the property cash, debt free. So if you haven't signed up yet and you still wanna sign up, we have two opportunities tonight, 
to go see the property, but you have to sign up, as Pastor Darrison mentioned in the video announcement. You gotta register because there's only so many seats available. So our next goal, and I mentioned this last week, but I really got the numbers locked in from our team this week on where we are, and I wanna show this graph. So here's this graph, if you can see the pink, is what has already been given. You guys, look at that, $5.6 million already has been given, which is absolutely incredible. And then the pledged, these are, these are those of you that said, I'm gonna give, I just can't give it all right at this second, so I've pledged a certain amount. So the total pledged right now is $474,000. I think y'all should clap for that too because that's pretty impressive. And so the final completion goal, it ends at $8.5 million. And so we are down to just shy of $3 million left. Right around $2.9 million that we're going to raise in cash. And that is gonna go into everything about this building. It is gonna be the renovation, and we are fully renovating it inside, outside, the flooring, the walls, the paint, the fascia, the parking lot, audio, visual, everything. So that gives you an idea of where we are today. And the quicker we raise the money, obviously, the quicker we get it renovated. And the quicker we get it renovated, the quicker we open for our third location that will be in South Scottsdale, Arizona. And so my prayer is that we continue to give with urgency and raise this money. And so if you have not ever given to this and you say, you know what, I'm in, there are these envelopes in your seat pocket. They say, do something radical on it. Take one out and pray about it and ask God, Lord, what kind of radical faith offering do you want me to give? And our goal is that by December 29th, we're gonna do a second seed offering. December 29th is the last Sunday of the month and we're gonna do a seed offering and hopefully we get our goal, no, I shouldn't say hopefully, and we will hit our goal of raising the rest of the money, yes, debt free. And oh, by the way, you don't have to wait till December, you know, 29th. If you just like, dude, I'm just gonna do it right now. I mean, we're not gonna turn you away. We're not gonna turn you away. I want us to finish the year strong. And, 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 and maybe you were here last weekend and you heard, but maybe today it was like, whoa, wait, we're starting a North Phoenix location and we're starting that North Phoenix location at Pinnacle High School starting on November 3rd. And if you were perhaps wanna be a part of that launch team, stick around after the third service and we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna get you up to date. But we are here to do something radical for Jesus Christ. Look at somebody and tell them, are you gonna do something radical? Come on, tell somebody. Are you gonna do something radical? So today I wanna to look for a few minutes at Radical influence, influence, the power of influence, and the power of influence in respect to other people, right? Because what are you doing with the gifts of influence and affluence that God has given you? As I said, every gift given by God comes with a responsibility, and that responsibility is actually a word in the Bible, it's a spiritual word, and that word is called stewardship. Say the word out loud, stewardship, steward. It's a biblical word, and most people think that it means to manage, which is not what it means, although it, it does include managing. Biblical stewardship is so much more than simply managing. It's managing, but with a holy reverence. You know what our world is missing in 2024? A reverence, a fear of God, a holy fear for who God is. Our world is a world of like, oh, I love God, but I'll live however the hell I want. We're missing a holy fear. We're missing the balance that, yes, there is the grace of God, but there's also the wrath of God. There is the grace of God, but there's also the punishment of God. And that is true in church as well. We're missing this reverence for not only who God is, 
but the reverence for the influence that he's trusted us with. This awe. Do you ever stand in awe of God? It, this awe, like this, this awe, this like I'm not worthy. This, this in the Bible, they would turn their face and fall to their knees and face the opposite direction, even from the voice of the presence of God, because I'm not worthy. We live in a generation that goes, I'm worthy. And this awe, this deep respect, this fear, a good fear, a holy fear for not only God, but the influence that he gives you. Because it's managing something that God gave you. It's managing something that is actually still God's. And God's gifts, those two gifts of influence and affluence, they are to be stewarded, not just well, but with a holy reverence and a holy fear. I don't know if you remember the story of Moses and the burning bush. How many remember this story? Raise your hand. Moses and the burning bush is in Exodus chapter three. I want to read this to you. If you want to know one passage, if you want to know one passage in the entire Bible that speaks to me, the loudest, it's this one. There's a lot of passages in the Bible. This one is the one that speaks the loudest to Travis Hearn personally. It says this in Exodus chapter three. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire and it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight and why the bush does not burn up. Verse four, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is what? What's it say? Holy ground. What's it say? Come on, everybody say it. What's it say? Holy ground. See, that's what I'm saying, the flippancy. The flippancy is, is, oh, it's a bush. Oh, it's just God. He's talking to me. But like, it's just like, we're homies. Like, Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt. Jesus is not your homeboy. He is the savior of the world. He is the master of the universe, the creator of the universe, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. He is majesty. He is majesty. He is to be feared and revered. And he says, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses, what do the next three words say? Hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. I love this. I don't know if I mentioned that, but I love this. Because the sentiment of this entire passage is a passage on a sentiment of reverence. The fire of God, the voice of God, a holy fear. Moses, do not come any closer. Yo, whoa, 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 don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. For the place you're standing is holy ground. He hid his face. Then watch this. Verse 7, watch this. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. Verse 9, this is what I want you to catch. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. See, I love this because... It tells me that God sees our pain. It tells me that God sees our bondage. It tells me that God sees our struggle, but that he doesn't just see it, but that he wants to do something about it. That he wants to get involved in your life, in the hardships of your life. And he goes, Moses, Moses, he says, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. And it's holy because of two reasons. It's holy because of the presence of God, but it's also holy because that's where Moses received the call of God. 
the call of God. That's holy. I tell my Impact Church staff, I don't know, all the time, every month, every other month, I said Impact Church is a gift from God. This is a move of God. It must be stewarded well. It must be handled with care and prayer. It must be handled with awe and reverence. It must not be taken lightly or flippantly. Moses, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. This is holy ground. The place you're standing is holy because God's presence is here and because God is calling you right here. Because the gifts, Moses, the gifts, Impact Church, that you've been given by God are holy ground. They are to be handled with awe, a holy fear, a care, a prayer. And I've always felt like the call of God on my life is holy. Y'all are really quiet today, abnormally quiet, making me uncomfortable quiet. <laughs> I've always felt the call on my life is holy. So much so that maybe you look at me and go, man, he leads with confidence. I actually lead with uh, fear. I lead with the fear, God, don't let me mess this up. God, don't let me get in the way of what you're trying to do. God, get me out of the way. I just want to follow you. I don't even want to be the person that's seen, God, this is you. It's you. This is you. This is your church. This is your ministry. This is, I consider my ministry to pro athletes and to the Phoenix Suns. It is holy. It's holy. Impact Church and the call of God on this church is holy. Because with every gift comes a reverence. Are you guys hearing me? A reverence. And every gift also comes with a trust. Can God trust you? Can he? Because some of y'all praying for a windfall. Can he trust you? Oh, God, I'll start tithing when. Well, he can't trust you. Hello? Oh, also, you don't know, understand, PT, things are tight. Things are not tight. Your faith is diminished. Your faith is bankrupt. Fa things aren't tight. Your faith, your faith is depleted. Can God trust you? Oh, God, give me a raise. Can he trust you? God, give me a promotion. Can he trust you? God, fix this situation, but can he, can he trust you with the gift? In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is called by God. That's why it was holy. Because he was going to use Moses to set his people free. Then one chapter later, it gets better. In one chapter later, Exodus chapter four, maybe you remember this story. Moses is talking to God and Moses has a staff in his hand and God goes, Moses, what's in your hand? How many remember this story? Raise your hand. It's okay if you don't, I'm gonna teach it to you. What's in your hand? And Moses says, a hey, staff. By the way, listen, anytime God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. He, he's not, he doesn't need your intelligence. He already knows. If God's asking you a question, he's trying to get you to think. He's trying to get you to ponder. He's trying to get you to consider. He's trying to get you to change. He's trying to get your attention. What is in your hand? Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses says, a staff. A staff, Lord. And God says to Moses, throw it down. And Moses throws the staff down, and we know the story. It immediately turns into a snake. And then God says, pick it back up. And as he does, it becomes a staff again. I love this story because this is taking chapter 3 and adding it another step further, another step deeper with God. See, God wants you to go another step deeper today. God wants you to go another step deeper today. He doesn't want you to stay in the shallow end impact church. He wants you to go another step deeper into the waters of God today. And I love this. One of my friends and mentors, Pastor Rick Warren, I think said it better than I've ever heard it said before. In regard to this story, he said, that staff represented everything that Moses was. It represented his identity. I'm a shepherd. 
so I have a shepherd's staff. It represented his influence because I'm a shepherd. It represented his income because I'm a shepherd. This staff represented everything about Moses, his identity, his income, his influence, and God says, throw it down. And what happens? It becomes alive. And then God says, pick it back up, and it becomes dead again. Impact Church family, God is asking you the same question today. What's in your hand? Your identity, your influence, your income. If you really want to see it become alive in your life, if you really want to see your identity, your influence, and your income come to life, listen, throw it down at the feet of God and watch what he does with it. Give it to God. Why are you guys so quiet today? Did we not do donuts and coffee this morning? We, we were handing out joints this morning. I, I, we got blunts in the lobby. I haven't been out there this morning. Is it blunt Sunday? My gosh, help our church service. You're just taking it all in? Some of you are yes. This section is yes. This section is still gonna just stare at me. It's all right, I love you guys. You know, biblical stewardship is about using your influence and affluence for God. Do you? Not for self. Some of you think you're selfless, but you're actually the opposite. The devil's tricked you into thinking you're selfless. You're selfish. Everything is about you. What you do, what you want, how you spend your money, how you want to do things, how you think, how you operate, how you live your life, how you, it, 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 l l listen, what I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to give you like secret sauce to like good living. Throw it down, throw it down, throw it down. Throw it down at the feet of Jesus. Man, some of you are clenched so tightly. You're clenching so tightly to the staff of your life. Like, man, I don't know. I don't want to let it go. I don't want to throw it down. And you're going to continue to live with a dead stick in your life. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, he said this, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Let's read it together. Ready? Here we go. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Let's read that again a little bit louder. Matthew 16, 25, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Whew. You know, Sometimes I read something, it's so good, all I can say is, ooh. <laughs> I think this story of Moses is interesting because it's all about influence. And here's what I think is crazy. The most crazy about this story is that from the moment of Exodus chapter four, from that one moment, from this very scene, the burning bush, the staff, Moses, what's in your hand? From the call of God on Moses' life, from that moment forward, Moses' staff was never called a staff again. From that moment forward, it would now be called the rod of God. It was now the rod of God, and the rod of God became a tool by which Moses performed all the miracles of the Exodus. It was the rod of God that he touched the rock and water came out. It was the rod of God that Moses held in the air and all the locusts and the different plagues uh, uh, took place. It was by the rod of God. Remember, Moses touched the Nile River and it turned into blood. It was by the rod of God that Moses parts the Red Sea. Listen, what I'm trying to tell you today, church family, is that when Moses finally figured out the secret sauce of life and he took his identity or what he thought it was, when he took his income, his influence, and he threw it at the feet of Jesus, the moment he figured this out, it not only became alive, but it became powerful and supernatural and miraculous.
And I have a question this morning. Does anybody want to see the power and the supernatural and the miraculous in your life today? You'll never see it by holding on to the staff. You've got to throw it down at the feet of God. What is in your hand today is every gift that God has given you. And all of that falls under your influence and your affluence because God expects you to use it for other people. God expects you to use it to build the kingdom of God. God wants to take the staff of your life and turn it into the rod of God in your life. God wants to use your influence and your affluence for him and for people, everybody. Somebody say everybody, 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 everybody has both influence and affluence. Everybody, say it again, everybody. Come on a little bit louder so I can hear it on the stage. Everybody, everybody has both influence and affluence. Influence, hear me, hear me. Influence is not fame. Influence is not popularity. You can be insanely famous and not influential. You can be insanely wealthy and not affluential. Every single person within the sound of my voice, you have both influence and affluence. I want to tell you today what it means to have influence. The word influence, it means this. The capacity to have an effect on the character. Whew, there's a big word. On the character on the development or the behavior of somebody. I think that's interesting because Jesus preached his very first sermon, the Sermon on the Mountain, chapter five of Matthew. He preached it on the idea of influence. The very first words Jesus ever spoke. Matthew chapter five, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you are the salt of the earth. That's influence. But if salt loses its saltiness, look at some of you today in here, you've lost your saltiness. You have somebody in here today, you've lost your saltiness. He says, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer, this, one, this one's terrifying. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. That's influence. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. Does your light give light to everyone in the house? And then he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do people see you and want Jesus Christ? Are people running to Jesus because of you, or are they running away from Jesus because of you? Did the salt keep its saltiness or did the salt lost its saltiness? Listen, I'm preaching to the choir because I've lived this so many times in my life. It's like the Travis Hearn roller coaster. Man, I'm salty. Man, I ain't got no salt. Man, I'm salty. Man, I ain't got no salt. Or man, I'm using salt for all the wrong reasons. Man, I got my light. I got no light. I'm turning my light off. Sometimes I, I look back in the history of Travis Hearn and I go, I use my influence for all the wrong things. I remember in high school, I took it upon myself. It was my life's mission to get the preacher's kid high. I was going to get the pastor's daughter high. I did. In high school, I thought that was a major success. Looking back, I'm like, thank God she turned out okay. Became a doctor. And she's not some drug addict on the street. Like, what are you using your influence for? See, I love this salt and light because it's a passage about influence and it's a very powerful passage and it's a very intentional passage because it's the first things that Jesus said. You are the salt and you are the light. You are the salt and you are the light. Come on, say it with me. I am the salt and I am the light. Say it again. I am the salt and I am the light because salt, I love salt. Anybody love some salt? You love a little salt on your, especially your French fries. You ever had a Mickey Donald's fries without salt? You didn't eat them, did you? No, the salt is part of the secret sauce of the French fry. You ever had Chick-fil-A French fries without salt? You didn't eat them. You threw them away. Salt loses saltiness. It's out. And I know everybody's craving Chick-fil-A, but it's Sunday. <laughs> Amazing that they take the Sabbath and they're still the 
best-selling fast food restaurant on the planet, isn't it? They actually close one day a week to honor God and to worship God. Hey, that's a word for some of you CEOs and business owners who think you gotta be going seven days a week. Imagine if you dedicated one day to God and rest and worship what he would do with your company, supernatural. Some of you will never know because you're too scared to try because your faith tank is running on empty. The salt and the light. Salt, man, salt. Salt is important in life. Salt. <laughs> because salt, it does three things, really. It, 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 seasons, it, it seasons the food, right? It improves the taste, right? It, it pres preserves, great, the food, good. You're preaching next Sunday. Help me out. I'm giving you one of the points. And, and, and that, that's the three major things. And listen, this is what God wants you to do with the world. He wants you to improve the world. He wants you to preserve, to preserve to preserve, hold up, not to pervert. That's a whole nother message, I really like that. That's a good title, preserve or pervert. <laughs> and to keep it from going rotten, I used to try to make the world rotten. He says, you're the light of the world. That's influence. He says, you're the salt of the earth. That's influence. The light is a dark world. For those of you that today's your first time, this is why Travis Hearn included the star in the branding of Impact Church. I included the star because I named the church Impact Church. I wanted a one word purpose statement. The name of the, I want one word that says it. What's one word God that says? The great commandment and the great commission. We were leading a Bible study of pro athletes called Impact Pro Athletes and I thought, oh, there it is, impact, perfect. That says it all. God, that you would impact me and God, that I would impact them and that you would be impacted by God and that you would make an impact for God. That's the great commission and the great commandment in one word. That I love the Lord God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and then I love my neighbor as yourself, impact. And then I thought, God, what's a good, what's a good branding star? What's, a, what's an image, a symbol that could go with it? Yes, I love the cross, the cross, come on somebody, the cross of Jesus. Christ it is the symbol of our faith but God led me to Philippians 2 15 and that's how we got the star in our branding because that scripture says that you would shine like stars in a dark and crooked universe influence 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 shine like stars the salt of the earth Remember, God doesn't want you to become a thermometer, but a thermostat. Big difference. A thermometer, there's a lot of thermometer Christians sitting in here today. There's a lot of thermometer Christians. See, a thermometer Christian, they reflect the temperature of culture. But a thermostat Christian controls the temperature of culture. And God is calling you today to be a thermostat Christian, not a thermometer Christian. Shine like stars, Impact Church. Influence the world, Impact Church. You are the light, you are the salt influence. Listen, some of you today, you might think you don't have any influence. Maybe today, maybe today you're like, oh, PT, I don't have influence. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I actually don't know what you're talking about because everybody has influence. You have influence on everybody you come into contact with every single day of your life. Influence with your friends, influence with your family, influence with your coworkers, influence with your teammates, with your neighbors, people at the store. You have influence on your social media, your Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, X, all of it. You have influence. I was talking to my youngest daughter this last week. I don't even know how we got on this conversation, but I said, man, if I, ha ha if I had, if I could go to high school all over again, but as a man of God, because I spent my entire high school career not as a man of God. I got saved on February 20th of 1993. Y'all can do the math and figure out my age, it's fine. 
1993, I got saved in February 20, 1993. And, and before that, I lived like the world. I looked like the world. I act like the world. I sounded like the world. I thought like the world. Now I got saved. February 20th, now I'm going to graduate high school in May. Man, I felt this urgency like, man, I have wasted my high school years. I've actually done the opposite of what God wanted me to do. Instead of leading people to the cross, I've led them away from the cross. Instead of leading people to the Bible, I've led them away from the Bible. And I was telling my youngest daughter, I said, if I had it to do all over again, imagine me going to high school again. Dude, I'm lighting that freaking world on fire for Jesus Christ. I, I talked to this one guy, this one, and obviously I cannot mention names, but I talked to this one NBA player that had a great career, maybe a 15-year career, and it was his last game. And he stuck around with me after the chapel service was over, and he goes, PT, he said, man, I'm so emotional. He said, I'm looking back at my entire NBA career and I've wasted the window. I've wasted the window. I've wasted it. Man, I had so many people I could, I love Jesus, I'm a Christian. My own team doesn't know it. Nobody knows it, I know it. Nobody else knows, I could have been there. I could have been there for him, I could have been there for him. Instead I wasted the window. My question today is, are you wasting the window? Because windows open for seasons and then they close. Windows open and windows close. Are you wasting the window of the influence that God has entrusted you with or are you just blowing it? Are you just spending it, spending my time and my talents and my treasures on whatever and just floating through life and like, oh, well, whatever. I mean, I do love God. Or are you gonna actually do something with the influence that God has given you? So many of you are, you know, you're great at this. If, 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 think about your influence. Many of you, you post stuff all the time about God, about scriptures, about your church, inviting people to church. You know, I don't have Facebook. Do I? Do I have Facebook? Well, my team was gonna make one. I don't know where my team is, other than my wife and my family. That's my all-star team, but... The, the, the reserves are somewhere. They, but they said, they said, they said, you know, you're going to put this book out. The fire is for you. And like, we're going big PT. And like, you need to go on a podcast. By the way, I've been to Vegas. I've been to Dallas. I've been to Miami. I've been a podcasting appearing fool and talking about the miracles of God. And you know, all the, none of the podcasts were like Christian podcasts. The all like secular business finances. Some of you are gonna see me everywhere here in about four weeks. You're gonna be like, there he is again, there he is again, there he is again, there he is again. And, 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 and so the, one, one, one of the, pub, the publisher, they said, you need a Facebook. And I said, that's for old people. <laughs> and then they said, yeah, but you're limiting your influence. And I said, okay, I'll have a Facebook. We're gonna start a Facebook. They're gonna start a Facebook. Is it still a thing? Or did it go out with, my, with MySpace? My, my, my place? My face? I, um, you know what I think people do with their influence? Waste it. What most people do with their windows is waste it. Watch this, this is crazy, this is crazy. Because God gave me a word, specific word for the closing of this today. You do not have to be somebody that's famous to have influence. In fact, there's a lot of famous people that they're not influential or they use their influence for what I would say are stupid things. A lot of, I don't even know why we call them influencers. Oh, I'm an influencer. Everybody's an influencer today. My question is, what are you influencing? I'm an influencer. You are? All I see is stupid skits every day. That's the dumbest skit again. Once, how do people keep following stupid influencers? Wasting windows, wasting windows, wasting windows. Hey, start using your window for Jesus Christ. He's the one that gave it to you anyway. Start using your influence for God. He's the one that gave it to you anyway. 
You don't even have to have a lot of followers. You don't even have to have a lot of followers. KC, how big was the church you grew up in? How many people? A hundred. A hundred people. I got saved in a church of a hundred people. It's a great church, yeah? Mine too. That man's still my pastor. A hundred people. One hundred people. So he led me to the Lord. A church of a hundred people. It's just as significant as our church. It's just as important. Maybe today you say, man, I got one follower. Great. Influence. Man, I got two followers. Great. Influence. Use your influence for God, not for the world. Stop pulling people away from the word and into the world. Stop doing what Travis Hearn did. And like, man, I'm going to try to get that girl high. I'm going to try to move that person further away from God. No, 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 we're not doing that. Listen, everyone has influence and God wants you to use it for him. God wants you to help build the kingdom with your influence one person at a time. Salt and light. Listen, some of you are great at salt and light and some of you aren't not great at salt and light. Others of you. Others of you. I almost don't even want to say this because I don't want it to come across too aggressive. But I really feel I'm supposed to say this. Others of you in here today, probably hundreds listening to this sermon now. And you know who you are. I don't know who you are, but you know who you are. You've turned your lamps off. Lamps off. The lights off. And Jesus said, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The problem is, that there's many of you to you've turned the lights off you have the power to turn it back on but you've turned the light you you're walking around in the darkness you're driving around have you ever driven around with the headlights off you're driving around in the darkness have you ever walked around in the dark without shoes on right you're driving around with your lights on listen 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 today I need you to hear this you're driving around with the lights off and it's not going to just ruin your own life it's going to ruin other people's lives too you're not going to just wreck your own life you're going to wreck other people's lives and God told me to tell you today that you need to turn your lights back on before you run your life off a cliff before you destroy your own life, before you destroy somebody else's life. It, it, you got to turn the lamp back on. See, listen, good stewardship, it begins by turning the lamp on. And now I have this responsibility, the light. It's not a pastor's responsibility only, it's our responsibility. Could you imagine? We've been one of the fastest growing churches in the nation for years. Every, but could you imagine? Imagine with me. Just picture this scene right now. If you have two friends right now, if you have two friends that don't go to church, raise your hand. If you have two friends that don't go to church, raise your hand. Look, look at all the hands. It's probably 99% of us. Okay, if you have two friends, imagine if every one of us next Sunday brought those two friends. Just that we would triple in attendance and we would triple in attendance. And because of that, people would give their life to Jesus Christ and they would be born again and they would have an eternity with heaven and not in hell and they would find hope and peace and joy. My question is this, but will you do it? So that's my challenge for you for next Sunday. Two friends, two friends. Look at somebody and say, two friends, two friends two friends. If you ain't got two friends coming, don't show up because I'm going to call you out on it. Two friends. I mean, I didn't set the bar real high. I mean, we got the entire Brophy football team, high school football team that comes to church every Sunday. That all started with one person going, let's go to Impact Church. Two friends. And I want to ask if you'll bow your heads because I want to close us in prayer. And as we close today, I want you to consider my words. I want you to consider my words. I wonder how many people you've influenced negatively because your lamp is off. 
Because the lamp doesn't just affect you, it affects everyone that you know. See, turning those headlights off, it threatens not only you, but it threatens everybody in the car with you, the car of life. I wonder how many people desperately needed you, but they never reached out because they needed the old you. Remember that one, the one that used to have the lamp turned on? The one who used to be on fire for Jesus Christ, the, the, the one that was an anchor during the storms in other people's lives, the one who had the lamp turned on. The one who used to lead them to God's word, but now leads them away from God's word because you turned the lamp off. The one who used to lead them to the cross, but now leads them away from the cross because you've turned the lamp off. Listen, running doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone in your boat. Just ask Jonah. Hiding doesn't affect you. It affects everyone in your life, just ask Adam and Eve. But the good news is, and there's always good news, is that the old you can be the new you today. Revelation chapter two, verse five, the word says, consider, consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. Listen, if you're here today and you know you can feel the power of the Holy Spirit and God is speaking to you and you say, PT, man, my lamp has been off. My lamp has been off and I turned it off. But today I want to turn that lamp back on. Would you raise your hand so I can see it today? Lots of you, lots of you, it's okay. I've been there, I've been right there. Keep your hand up for just a minute, PT. Today, I wanna turn the lamp on. I wanna turn the lamp on. I'm so proud of you guys. I'm so, so proud of you guys. I wanna turn the lamp on. I wanna turn the lamp on. Man, I've been walking around in some darkness, but I wanna turn the lamp on. And if you raise your hand, I want you just to pray. Pray this prayer and say, dear Jesus, today I, I turn the lamp back on. Today, I'm choosing to flip the switch and let your light shine. God, I want to throw it all down for you. My identity, my influence, my income, I want to throw it at the feet of Jesus today, God, and I want to watch it become alive, not for me, but for you and for other people. God, I want to make this world a better place today. God, we want to, we want to turn the lamps on, and the way we turn the lamps on is we say, Jesus, we give you full control of our lives today. God, we surrender to you today. God, we want to live for you today, and we're grateful that you died for us. Lord, give us a fire in our soul to use the influence and the affluence that you've given us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Impact Church, we all say amen. 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 God bless you guys. We love you guys.